remember your mercies, O Lord, and with your eternal protection, sanctify your servants, for whom Christ your Son, by shedding of his blood, established the Paschal Mystery, who lives and reigns forever and ever. A reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. See, my servant shall prosper. He shall be raised high and greatly exalted. Even as many were amazed at him, so marred was his look beyond human semblance and his appearance beyond that of the sons of man. So shall he startle many nations. Because of him kings shall stand speechless. For those who have not been told shall see those who have not heard shall ponder it. Who would believe what we have heard? To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up like a sapling before him, like a shoot from the parched earth. There was in him no stately bearing to make us look at him, nor appearance that would attract us to him. He was spurned and avoided by people, a man of suffering, accustomed to infirmity, one of those from whom people hide their faces, burned, and we held him in no esteem. Yet it was our infirmities that he bore, our sufferings that he endured, while we thought of him as stricken, as one smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our offenses, crushed for our sins. Upon him was the chastisement that makes us whole. By his stripes we were healed. We had all gone astray like sheep, each following his own way, but the Lord laid upon him the guilt of us all. Though he was harshly treated, he submitted and opened not his mouth. Like a lamb led to the slaughter, or a sheep before the shears, he was silent and opened not his mouth. Oppressed and condemned, he was taken away, and who would have thought any more of his destiny? When he was cut off from the land of the living and smitten for the sin of his people, a grave was assigned him among the wicked and a burial place with evildoers, though he had done no wrong, nor spoken any falsehood. But the Lord was pleased to crush him in infirmity. If he gives his life as an offering for sin, he shall see his descendants in a long life, and the will of the Lord shall be accomplished through him. Because of his affliction, he shall see the light and fullness of days. Through his suffering, my servant shall justify many, and their guilt he shall be bear. Therefore I will give him his portion among the great, and he shall divide the spoils with the mighty, because he surrendered himself to death and was accounted among the wicked. And he shall take away the sins of many and win pardon for their offenses. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God.
approach A laughing stock to my neighbors and a dread to my friends They who see me abroad flee from me I am forgotten like the unremembered dead I am like a dish that is broken A reading from the letter to the Hebrews. Brothers and sisters, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has similarly been tested in every way yet without sin. So let us confidently approach the throne of grace to receive mercy and to find grace for timely help. In the days when Christ was in the flesh, he offered prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverence. Son though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered. And when he was made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
The Passion of Our Lord Jesus Christ According to John. Glory to you, O Lord. John went out with his, Jesus went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley to where there was a garden into which he and his disciples entered. Judas, his betrayer, also knew the place because Jesus had often met there with his disciples. So Judas got a band of soldiers and guards from the chief priests and the Pharisees and went there with lanterns, torches, and weapons. Jesus, knowing everything that was going to happen to him, went out and said to them, Whom are you looking for? They answered him, Jesus, the Nazarene. He said to them, I am. Judas, his betrayer, was also with them. When he said to them, I am, they turned away and fell to the ground, so he again asked them, whom are you looking for? They said, Jesus, the Nazarene. Jesus answered, I told you that I am. So if you are looking for me, let this man go. This was to fulfill what he had said. I have not lost any of those you gave me. And then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's slave and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword into the scabbard. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father gave me? So the band of soldiers, the tribune, and the Jewish guard seized Jesus, bound him, and brought him to Annas first. He was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year. It was Caiaphas who had counseled the Jews that it was better to have one man uh, should die rather than the people. Simon Peter and another disciple followed Jesus. Now the other disciple was known to the high priest, and he entered the courtyard of the high priest with Jesus. But Peter stood at the gate outside. So the other disciple, the acquaintance of the high priest, went out and spoke to the gatekeeper and brought Peter in. Then the maid who was the gatekeeper, said to Peter, You are not one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the slaves and the guards were standing around a charcoal fire that they had made because it was cold and were warming themselves. Peter was also standing there keeping warm. The high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his doctrine. Jesus answered him, I have spoken publicly to the world. I have always taught in a synagogue, all in the temple area, where all the Jews gather, and in secret. I have said nothing. Why ask me? Ask those who heard me what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had heard this, he said, The one one, he had said this, one of the temple guards standing there struck Jesus and said, Is this the way you answer the high priest? Jesus answered him, If I have spoken wrongly, testify to the wrong. But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? Then Annas sent him a bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing there keeping warm, and they said to him, you are, you are not one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, a relative of the one whose ear Peter had cut off, said, Didn't I see you in the garden with him? Again Peter denied it, and immediately the cock crowed. Then they brought Jesus from Caiaphas to the praetorium. It was morning and they themselves did not enter the praetorium in order not to be defiled uh, so that they could uh, eat the Passover. So Pilate came out to them and said, What charge do you bring against this man? They answered and said to him, If he were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. At this, Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your laws. 
The Jews answered him, We do not have the right to execute anyone. In order that the word of Jesus might be fulfilled that he said, indicating the kind of death he would die. So Pilate went back to the praetorium and summoned Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you say this on your own, or have others told you about me? Pilate answered, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests happen to bring you over to me. What have you to say, and what have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom does not belong to this world. If my kingdom did belong to this world, my attendants would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not here. So Pilate said to him, Then you are a king. Jesus answered, You say I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate said to him, What is truth? When he had said this, he again went out to the Jews and said to them, I find no guilt in him, but you have a custom that I release a prisoner to you at Passover. Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? They cried out again, Not, Not this one, one, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a revolutionary. Then Pilate uh, took Jesus and had him scourged. And the soldiers wove a crown of thorns and placed it on his head and clothed him in a purple cloak. And they came to him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And then they struck him repeatedly. Once more Pilate went out and said to them, Look, I am bringing him out to you, so that you may know that I find no guilt in him. So Jesus came out, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple cloak, and Pilate said to them, Behold the man. When the chief priests and the guards saw them, they cried out, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no guilt in him. The Jews answered, We have a law, and according to that law he ought to die, because he made himself the Son of God. Now when Pilate heard this statement, he became even more afraid and went back into the praetorium and said to Jesus, Where are you from? Jesus did not answer him, so Pilate said to him again, Do you not speak to me? Do you not know that I have power to release you, and I have power to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no power over me if it had not been given to you from above. For this reason, the one who handed me over to you has the greatest sin. Consequently, Pilate tried to release him, but the Jews cried out, If you release him, you are not a friend of Caesar. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and seated him on the judge's bench in the place called Stone Pavement, in Hebrew, Gabbatha. It was preparation day for Passover, and it was about noon. And he said to the Jews, Behold your king. They cried out, Take, take him away, take, take him away, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, We have no king but Caesar. Then he handed him over to be crucified. So they took Jesus, and carrying the cross himself, he went out to what is called the place the skull, in Hebrew, Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with two others, one on either side, with Jesus in the middle. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus the Nazarene, the King of the Jews. Now many of the Jews read this inscription, because of the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, Latin, and Greek. So the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, 
Do not write the king of the Jews, but that he said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. Now when the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four shares, a share for each soldier. They also took his tunic, but the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from top down. So they said to one another, Let's not tear it, but cast lots for it to see whose it will be. In order that the passage of Scripture might be fulfilled that says, They divided my garments among them, for my vestiture they cast lots. This is what the soldiers did, standing by the cross of Jesus, where his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Cleophas, and Mary of Magdala, when Jesus saw his mother and the disciple there whom he loved, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour the disciple took her into his home. After this, aware that everything was now finished, in order that the scripture might be fulfilled, Jesus said, I thirst. There was a vessel filled with common wine, so they put a sponge soaked in wine on a sprig of hyssop and put it to his mouth. When Jesus had taken the wine, he said, It is finished. And bowing his head, he handed over his spirit. Now, since it was preparation day, in order that the bodies might not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for the Sabbath day of that week was a solemn one, the Jews asked Pilate that the, their legs be broken and that they be taken down. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and then the other one who was crucified with Jesus. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one soldier thrust his lance into his side, and immediately blood and water flowed out. An eyewitness has testified, and his testimony is true. He knows that he is speaking the truth, so that you also may come to believe. For this happened, so that the scripture passage might be fulfilled. Not a bone of it will be broken. And again, another passage says, they will look upon him whom they have pierced. After this, Joseph of Arimathea, secretly a disciple of Jesus for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate if he could remove the body of Jesus, and Pilate permitted it. So he came and took his body. Nicodemus, the one who had first come to him at night, also came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes weighing about a hundred pounds. They took the body of Jesus and bound it in burial cloths along with the spices according to the Jewish burial custom. Now in the place where he had been crucified there was a garden and in the garden was a new tomb into which no one had yet been buried. So they laid Jesus there because of the Jewish preparation day, for the tomb was close by. The Gospel of the Lord. Glory to you, Lord of God, Lord Jesus Christ. Glory to you, Lord of God. Here we are on day two of the Easter, the Triduum 
on this day, which we normally know as Good Friday. This day is also known as Long Friday, the Passion of our Lord. We may ask ourselves, what is there that is good about this day? What makes it good? At the end of this day, we feel exhausted, we feel worn out. Someone mentioned to me, I've never been so much to church in one week. And I said, you have Saturday to go and Sunday. And it's true. We haven't been so much into the church as much as this one week. So can we take a break afterwards? No way. Can this uh, uh, cover up for the rest when we ever miss? No way. Actually, this is the very beginning of why we should always be there. Because the question was, were you there when they crucified my Lord? Were you there when he was nailed onto the tree? Were you there when he was laid into the tomb? And the answer is up to each one of us to answer. The good things that we are here tonight, as we reflect on the meaning of suffering, the meaning of pain, the meaning of sorrow, the meaning of death, crucifixion. People might say, we've had enough suffering. Let's have another topic. Let's have something much better to, to talk about. We've had enough of suffering and pain If it is true that the one who we follow took this path, that's why we got to face it. We don't run away from it. Neither did he. We face the cross of suffering in our lives. Suffering is part of our journey of faith. If it hasn't come to you or to anyone, maybe it will happen someday. And when it happens, how should we respond to it? This day, in a way, prepares us for all that is there to come in our lives. That is, as long as we chose and make the decision to follow Christ. He had so many who followed him and following him for various reasons. Some dropped off after some time. Others had to follow him all the way and to the very end. Even when it was so difficult, he felt abandoned. He felt alone. He almost felt like giving up and pray to his father. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Crucify him. Crucify him. When we were very young, okay, not very, very, very young, but young enough to understand. I always loved this gospel reading, The Passion, because it was so long and at least we had a chance to say something. Because normally it's a priest or a deacon who will read and all we have to say, the last, what, what do we say when the, the deacon says uh, the gospel of the Lord? Oh, I almost forgot it. Thank you for reminding me. So sometimes we only wait for those words, glory to your Lord, quiet, and wait for the last one. But this time, I felt like we had more phrases to punch in. And I waited for that. 
when the crowd say, crucify him, who are you? You know? Especially if there was a priest here and you knew that priest was like, you know, you had a moment to tell him. You had a moment to, but imagine how this whole story started without being aware how it was going to end. I don't know how old you are, but I know how old I am. But I can remember that the many times I've read this gospel reading and we've heard, had to go through these seasons, I know the end. I know how it is going to turn out to be. But imagine in the Elo Temple, System Laban, at the moment in time when they had no idea how this whole story was going to end. The fear around, not knowing what to do, everyone trying to figure out what Jesus is going to do, waiting for, for a surprise of some sort. It didn't happen. It didn't happen. They were all dispersed at that moment when they realized that it was true. The reality of the cross is, the cross is, he foretold this only if they would remember that the Son of Man will be raised, will be raised. He will be abandoned. He will, he will be crucified and he will die. Sometimes we don't want to hear so much suffering, especially, you know, that the suffering of others. We always want to take the good part. We always want to take the joyful part of someone. If someone were to tell their story, and their story from uh, their childhood, they are growing up, it's all pain. Sometimes you feel like, can you stop there, please? Can we, wasn't there anything that really is exciting? We always want life to be very exciting, very pleasing, nothing to worry about. That is the human tendency. That's who we are. But our faith teaches us that life may not necessarily be a bed of roses all the way. In our life, there will be moments when we have to carry the cross. There will be moments when suffering comes our way without us calling it, inviting it. And when it comes, where do we turn our eyes? Where do we look? How do we respond? Do we feel abandoned? Do we ever cry out and say, my Lord, my Lord, why have you forsaken me? Do we get into despair and hopelessness and even abandoning our faith because we feel like God has abandoned us? So when, that, when those moments happen, my dear brothers and sisters, let us remember, even when they thought the cross will be the end, it wasn't the end at all. Even as he hung on the cross, not any of his bones was broken because it wasn't the end. Even as we make our journey through these days, this is not the end. It's getting dark. And as the night comes, it gets even darker. When the birds fly home in safety, and hopefully after here we'll go home, make, your, make sure your lights are working, your headlamps are working, because it will be dark. Make sure you have something to keep you hopeful. Make, the, make sure that you have somewhere to hang on, even when it is dark. And it is even worse when it gets cold. 
Tomorrow is going to be very cold, colder than today. Yeah. It could even make life very uncomfortable. But it's, that, but it's always the hope of the dawn of a new day. The brand new sun that comes up. That's what we have at the end of it all. That is our hope. That after we've gone through these gruesome days of mourning our Lord. Someone asked me a question this afternoon. How many days, Father, did Jesus spend in the tomb? Can you help me? Can you give me an answer, please? Are you sure? Uh-huh. When do they begin? Anyway, you are right. Unless they had a way of knowing it is three days. They could count. They would know that it's not going to be long. At least after those three days, something great will happen. So those moments when you felt like you were in the darkness of the tomb, when the veil of the temple has been drawn, when lightning strikes in your life, when was it? I think it was this week, um, on Wednesday, did you hear the thunder and the lightning and everything? And worse, in the evening, because you're afraid the power might go, that's one thing. The roof might give way. Then what's the other? You might die. Yeah. Oh my. I didn't know. Yes. Lightning is, is dangerous. That's why they, they tell us that when you see lightning, what do you do? Go to where it is what? The safest place in your home. Where is that safest place you can be in the moment of darkness and in the moments of uh, difficulty, in the moments of pain and suffering? You got to find it. You got to know where it is. You got to be sure that as soon as all these come into your life, you know the direction there. We know where it is when we place our eyes on the Lord. The cross which seemed to be the worst humiliation of death instead is where we run to because he gave it new meaning. Jesus transformed the cross. He made it new. If it was the wood from the tree that had been cut, Jesus now gives it new life. He gives it new life not for himself, but for the rest of us. That we don't in any way be ashamed of the cross. Instead, we face the cross. We embrace the cross. And in this liturgy, we are going to venerate the cross. Because it is so powerful. It is so meaningful. It is so essential in our lives that we can hardly do away with it. What do we do when we come into the church? We sign ourselves. That is if we remember. When we were young, our mommy would hold our hands and make sure. I didn't know what it meant, but now I know. I know. We sign our Souls, because the devil is afraid of the cross. The devil was shamed when the devil thought it would bring shame to humankind. Instead, the devil was shamed. That's why we sign our cross, ourselves with the sign of the cross with courage and with joy because Jesus gave it new meaning. Even as you drive, by the way, you kind of hear the siren uh, Make a sign of the cross. Pray for those, the, the first responders, you know, uh, the police who are running to the scene wherever they are going for the life of whoever is in danger. It is very easy. Can we do it? I don't hear enough voices. 
Thank you. Oh, I was almost like, oh my. Maybe we're in the wrong church. Yes, it is true. Don't be afraid of the cross. Sometimes it may come in a very ugly way. But remember that on this day that Jesus gave the cross new meaning. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. At this moment, we're now going to have the general intercessions. Let us pray. At dear every Lord. intercession, we will be, will be asked to pray and will be asked to kneel if you can. Let us pray, dearly beloved, for the Holy Church of God, that our God and Lord be pleased to give her peace, to guard her and to unite her throughout the whole world, and grant that, leading our life in tranquility and quiet, we may glorify God the Father Almighty. Almighty, ever-living God, who in Christ revealed your glory to the nations, watch over the works of your mercy that your church spread throughout all the world may persevere with steadfast faith in confessing your name through Christ our Lord. Let us pray also for our most holy father, Pope Francis, that our God and Lord, who chose him for the order of bishops, may keep him safe and unharmed for the Lord's holy church to govern the holy people of God. Almighty, ever-living God, by whose decree all things are founded, look with favor on our prayers and in your kindness protect the Pope chosen for us, that under him the Christian people, governed by you, by you their maker, may grow in merit by reason of their faith. Through Christ our Lord. Let us pray also for our Bishop Barry Nestow, for all bishops, priests, and deacons of the church, and for the whole of the faithful people. Almighty, ever-living God, by whose spirit the whole body of the church is sanctified and governed, hear our humble prayer for your ministers that by the gift of your grace all may serve you faithfully through Christ our Lord.
catechumens. Let us pray also for catechumens, that our God and Lord may open wide the ears of their inmost hearts and unlock the gates of his mercy, that, having received forgiveness of all their sins through the waters of rebirth, they too may be one with Christ Jesus our Lord. Almighty, ever-living God, who make your church ever fruitful with new offspring, increase the faith and understanding of our catechumens, that reborn in the font of baptism, they may be added to the number of your adopted children through Christ our Lord. Let us pray also for our brothers and sisters who believe in Christ, that our God and Lord may be pleased as they live the truth to gather them together and keep them in his one church. Almighty ever-living God, who gather what is scattered and keep together what you've gathered, look kindly on the flock of your Son, that those whom one baptism has consecrated may be joined together by integrity of faith and united in the bond of charity through Christ our Lord. For the Jewish people. Let us pray also for the Jewish people, to whom the Lord our God spoke first, that he may grant them to advance in love of his name and in faithfulness to his covenant. Almighty, ever-living God, who bestowed your promises on Abraham and his descendants, graciously hear the prayers of your church, that the people you first made your own may attain the fullness of redemption through Christ our Lord. Let us pray also for those who not, do not believe in Christ, that enlightened by the Holy Spirit, they too may enter on the way of salvation. Almighty, ever-living God, Grant to those who do not confess Christ that by walking before you with a sincere heart they may find the truth and that we ourselves being constant in mutual love and striving to understand more fully the mystery of your life may be made more perfect witnesses to your love in the world through Christ our Lord. For those who do not believe in God, let us pray also for those who do not acknowledge God, that following what is right in sincerity of heart, they may find the way to God himself.
Almighty, ever living God, who created all people to seek you always by desiring you and by finding you come to rest, grant we pray that despite every harmful obstacle, all may recognize the signs of your fatherly love and the witness of the good works done by those who believe in you. And so in gladness confess you, the one true God, the Father of our human race, through Christ our Lord. Let us pray also for those in public office, that our God and Lord may direct their minds and hearts according to his will for the true peace and freedom of all. Almighty, ever-living God, in whose hand lies every human heart and the rights of peoples, look with favor, we pray, on those who govern with authority over us, that throughout the whole world, the prosperity of peoples, the assurance of peace, and the freedom of religion may, through your gift, be made secure through Christ our Lord. For those in tribulation, let us pray, dearly beloved, to God the Father Almighty, that he may cleanse the world of all errors, banish disease, drive out hunger, unlock prisons, loosen fetters, granting to travelers safety, to pilgrims return, health to the sick, and salvation to the dying. Almighty, ever-living God, comfort of mourners, strength of all who toil, may the prayers of those who cry to you in any tribulation come before you, that all may rejoice because in their hour of need your mercy was at hand through Christ our Lord. Let us pray, dearly beloved, for a swift end to the coronavirus pandemic that affects our world, that our God and Father will heal the sick, strengthen those who care for them, and help us all to preserve in faith. Almighty and merciful God, source of all life, health, and healing, look with compassion on our world brought low by disease. Protect us in the midst of the grave challenges that assail us, and in your fatherly providence, grant recovery to the stricken, strength to those who care for them, and success to those working to eradicate this scourge through Christ our Lord. We have come now to the end 
of the first part of this liturgy. And next we shall be having the adoration of the Holy Cross. I'll ask that you remain standing and I'll go and bring the cross and I will elevate the cross at three stations and with the words behold the wood of the cross on which hung the salvation of the world and our response will be come let us adore. Behold the wood of the cross on which hung the salvation of the world. Oh, Come, let us adore. Behold the wood of the cross on which hung the salvation of the world. Oh God, let us adore. Behold the wood of the cross, on which hung the salvation of the World, oh, come and let us dwell. <laughs> Different from what we do normally. The provision we have on this day is to come and venerate the cross, but without touching the cross. So we shall have to come in line, of course, following our distances in between like we've normally been doing as we come for Holy Communion. Then we bow, we make a solemn bow, then we go either on your right or on the left from and go back to where our seats are. And you'll be guided by the ashes. Hopefully we can do it solemnly and as quickly and in the best way that we can, being mindful of others. Thank you.
We are now entering the third part of this liturgy and is the liturgy of Holy Communion. At the Savior's command, and formed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, allowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the hope of your mercy, we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For the King.
Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called the Supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy of the Shabbat. Yeah. 
Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, who have restored us to life by the blessed death and resurrection of your Christ, preserve in us the work of your mercy that by partaking of this mystery we may have life unceasingly devoted to you through Christ our Lord. I would like in a special way to thank you for participating in this second day of the Triduum, more especially those who are praying with us at home, uh, remotely on our online, and also those who are praying in our provisional church for the extra space for those who cannot be here with us, but they're right there. I thank you very much. Just you know that it doesn't matter where you are, as long as you believe and have faith. But as a reminder that you come early, and as early as you come, you can be able to occupy the space here in the church. At least I have a, park, I have a parking spot. Thank you for that. And the rest of us, especially those who are visiting, uh, welcome St. Mark, and we hope uh, these days of our prayer with you may bring and renew in each of us the joy of our faith. Thank you to our staff and our ministers, our deacons, our music ministry, and our ushers in a very special way. Thank you. And of course, our friends and our brothers and sisters, uh, the police at the entrance of our church. I hope we can go home very safely again in that silent prayer and hope we can join again soon tomorrow at 8. 8, hopefully we all are here and ready to celebrate Holy Saturday. Please bow your heads. May abundant blessing, O Lord, we pray, descend upon your people who have honored the death of your Son in the hope of their resurrection. May pardon come, comfort be given, holy faith increase, and everlasting redemption be secure through Christ our Lord.